Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, wood turning. We'll take a look at the art of turning something like this into something like this. And we'll visit the annual Delta County Wildlife Unlimited Banquet. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. The call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan I've certainly spent a good share of my time searching for trees. Dead trees, that is. A distinguished UP pastime known as looking for firewood. Hunting for firewood or not, if you've spent any time in the woods, you've undoubtedly seen odd growths hanging off the side of otherwise normal trees. These, of course, are known as burls. A burl is a result of a tree undergoing some sort of stress. Maybe caused by an injury, or a virus, or fungus. To many, this is simply an unappealing distortion of a tree. To others, like wood turner Daryl Thurston, it contains a beautiful piece of artwork just waiting to be revealed. Well, Brian, you brought this birch barrel, so we're going to cut her open and see what, if we can get anything out of this. There are some pretty good sized cracks and checks in here, so we'll cut it open and see if it's, if it's any good or not. If it is, we'll throw it on the lathe and, and uh, see if we can't make a bowl out of it. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to get the best cut I can get out of it so we can get the best uh, looking piece. So as we're looking at it here, we got a flat spot over here. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to cut it across this way so we can utilize this whole section here so it'll balance itself out. I want to keep as much of the main piece of the log on there until we get ready to round it off uh, so I have something to mount it to as a piece of waste wood. Well, it looks like it's solid enough, and we got a lot of nice spalding in there, so hopefully the inside of it will be the same way. It certainly looks like it's going to be. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock these edges off, because it keeps it so far out of balance that if you don't knock the edges off, everything starts jumping all over the place, so, especially when you get up at about 1,000 RPMs. All right, let's take her inside, and we'll find our center, and then we'll mount her up and put her on the lathe. So now what we're going to try to do is we're going to find as close as we can to center. It'll probably be out of balance because of this bark wood over here and whatnot, but I think we can work with that. So we'll mount it up, put it on the lathe. I'll try to get that fairly well balanced on here. Bring the tail stock up to support it. You always want to test to make sure that nothing's going to hit. See how it's going to look. This is what they call a bowl gouge, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to work that edge off and try to get this thing in balance. This is probably about the hardest part of this whole thing because you're, you're jump, jumping all over the place because it's so far out of round. Look at all this spalding here. That's just going to be absolutely gorgeous if we can get this bowl to work. I think we can. It might be thinner than what we hoped for, but we can probably make this thing work. It's 
spalding is, is nothing but a mold that's in the wood. And in each one of these black lines is an individual mold or spore. And what it does, it puts up these black lines as a wall so other spore can't cross it. I'm gonna back this off and I'm gonna start creating a foot so that we can get a hold of it with the jaws. I've got these calipers set for my, my set of jaws so I know how much I have to take down off there yet. It looks like just about an eighth of an inch. So what I'm doing is I'm turning my gouge right completely over and I'm just using a scraping action and it's a real fine cuts. And when you're doing this you gotta just kind of slow right down and just shave the edge of it off. Well what this will do is it not only will it uh, uh, take all the high spots and stuff off and smooth it, but it'll also uh, take a lot of the tearing as you see right here. There's a lot of tearing and stuff. And now we've eliminated all that tearing down in here just simply by, by scraping that off. Well, what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna take it off the lathe and I'm gonna put it onto a chuck. I'll put the chuck on the lathe and then we can spin this around and we can start working on the other end. So then we're gonna to start to hollow it. Bring the tailstock back up again to support it. Now this is what they call a push cut. So what I'm doing is I'm pushing into it as I get in there farther, then I'll start a pull cut, and I'll show you what that is here in a second. The tool wants to jump around because it's uneven. So I'll leave a post right there in the center. And we're gonna turn around and do a pull cut here. Should be safe enough now, I can take this tailstock out of here. Uh, depending on the size of the bowl itself, but you try to leave about one inch of thickness so that as it warps or as it moves, then when you put it back on the machine, you have enough thickness to put it back in the round again. The smaller bowls, you can get down about three quarters of an inch, but most of the time I stay right around one inch. If I get up into a real big bowl, then I'll go about an inch and a quarter. The more consistency you have as far as thickness, the whole length of the bowl, the less apt it is to do a lot of warping too. They were about an inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter right there, so we're gonna thin that down. But then we're getting wider as we go to the bottom of the bowl, so we'll take and we'll trim that down some more. When this dries down, then we can come in here and we can scrape this all out of here and the tearing will disappear. But right now we're pretty consistent as far as thickness, wall thickness. So now we'll take it off the lathe, we'll sign it with being birch. Now a lot of guys, what they do is they'll weigh them and they'll keep checking the weight on them to make sure that the moisture is dissipating out of it. Some guys will only do seal the, the end grains. Myself, I just, I just coat the whole piece. And then I just tip it upside down and stick it underneath the bench here with the rest of them and, and let them dry down until they get 8%. I got a moisture tester to let me know what the moisture content is. Matter of fact, we'll check it right now and see what it is. Right now there's 21% moisture in there. So we gotta come down a long ways before she's dry. This is an anchor seal. Uh, this is what they use for uh, uh, putting on logs to, to save logs from cracking and checking. And we put it on our bowls. And I'm just gonna cover everything so it seals it, the whole thing. Some people, all they do is just the end grain, but being this is a, a burl, there's really not a lot of grain direction to it. So I just coat everything. And it allows it to seal up and dry slower. And I have a lot less warping and a lot less cracking. Sometimes it doesn't make any difference how much you seal it up, it's still gonna warp and crack. I just wanna slow down the process so it doesn't crack and check near as much. And then a lot of times what I'll do, if I have some, some voids in a piece, I'll take and fill them with a turquoise or I'll fill them with a coffee grounds or uh, fill them with copper. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of ways that you can fill them. I think this void is gonna be perfect when you start getting into it. It's gonna open that up and give a hole through the side of it, making some beautiful character to it.
it is. Now all you gotta do is let her dry. So in the meantime, we'll grab another piece. We'll work on that. So now what we're gonna do, since we've got, uh, we finished that out and we've coated it up uh, with an uh, anchor seal. Now that's gonna take anywhere from eight months to, to a year to dry. So we picked up another bowl here and this is a maple barrel. If I remember correctly, this one I dug out of the ground, 7.7. .7. So it's good enough to throw on the lathe and it won't have a tendency of warping. So we're gonna put this one on the lathe and we're gonna see if we can't finish it out for you. And you can see a lot of the burl of the eye and stuff inside of this. This has been drying since 218 of 16. And the moisture content on this is 7.7. .7. So as long as you're below 8%, you shouldn't have any problems as far as it warping. Too badly, anyway. Let's see what it looks like when you put it on the lathe. They're all gonna move. You just try to get them so that they move as little as possible. Oh boy, that was not bad at all. Holy macro. This is just a block of ash. And so when I bring my tail stock up, I can shove it right down in the, in the bottom of the bowl. And what that's going to do is that's going to stabilize it. So if there's any real bad warp in it, which there's not in this one, uh, but it'll keep it from pulling out of the, the chuck also. You know, again, I'm, you know, we were talking about leaving this thicker. And the reason, again, why we do it is so if, if, if it warps, you have enough thickness to be able to get it back into the round and still have a bowl. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to bring it back around so that it takes the warp out of it. There's not much warp in this bowl. We really lucked out. There's some that really take off on us, but this one here is pretty good. So you'll notice the warp right here now. When we're finished here, this outside, we're going to lose this warp. We'll be able to take enough material off here to bring it back in around. So we'll start right back here on the base. You can hear it jumping. It's because it's out around. Tool isn't jumping now because we've got it pretty much in the round. Now when it comes back out to this green piece here, then it's going to start jumping again because it's out around. You. And now you can really see the difference between the two. You don't see any wobble here, but you do here. So there you can definitely see that. This edge is where it's, it's warped the worst. Showing warp right here, that'll go when I, when I clean the inside of the bowl out. But the outside of the bowl, we've lost all of our warp. Switch to the inside. Put it just a hair below center line, and so when you when you lay your tool and it's pitched down just a, just a touch. But other than that, uh, you know I take it uh, up a little bit higher when I'm when I'm scraping with my my scraper and taper it down. So I'm still running almost center line of the piece. But you can get you can get uh, set collars. So when you put a set collar on here, and tighten it down. It's going to stay the same height all the time. So if you're doing uh, production work or anything like that, uh, you know that you don't have to mess with it, you don't have to look for it. It's, every time you put your tool rest on there, it's just the same spot every time. Pretty cool. hear that chatter, that's my warp. As soon as I get that warp out of there, you won't hear that chatter no more. What have we got for thickness here? I know we're too, we're too thick yet. Yeah, I see we're about uh, five eighths. That's pretty consistent right to that point. 
and you take this edge down a little bit. There's our bottom side right there, so that's <laughs> that's how much we got to take out of there. So I'm just going to go a little bit deeper as I go in here. So look at the eyes and stuff in there. Holy old macro. Now see what I'll do when I start sanding this. These uh, bark inclusions, as I'm sanding those, I'll fill it with sawdust and hit it with CA glue. It helps cure everything so that they don't fall out. Well, that's going to be a gorgeous piece. It's a round nose scraper. This is just a smaller version from that big one that I had. Now this has got a negative rake on it so that it has less of a tendency to, to catch or grab. And especially when you're inside of a bowl like this, you don't need any grab in it. But normally you try to run at a faster speed. It's because it's smoother. You know, you don't get near as much jumping. You don't get near as much tear out. You know, when you're roughing out or if it's out of balance, you have to go at a slower speed. Uh, otherwise, the machine will walk right across the floor. Get a big wobble or something of that nature, and it's too high a speed, and something's got to give. And as we got it closer to round, I could keep increasing the speed so it was smoother, you know, when I'm cutting. Your smaller bowls, uh, and, and depending on what you care for, uh, I try to get most of my bowls around three-eighths of an inch thick, sometimes a quarter of an inch thick. If I have a bigger bowl, a big salad bowl or serving bowl of some kind, I'll keep it maybe around a half an inch. It's preference. You know, I mean, a lot of people, they like a heavier bowl, a thicker bowl. Uh, other people, they like a thinner, uh, more elegant bowl, I should say, I guess. So the thinner they are, the more elegant they become. Uh, it takes a lot of weight, excess weight and stuff out of them. Uh, but I try to stay anywhere around three eighths of an inch to, to a quarter of an inch. Feels like it's pretty consistent up the way through now, so I think we're where the stage now. Yeah, we could take that down a hair. That's good right through there. In the bottom of this bowl, I'm going to recess this area right here so it has a, a contour that drops down in the bottom of this bowl. So you'll see a distinctive drop from uh, approximately right in here down. And then we'll clean up this high spot right here and we'll be all set. But you can see all the character in that piece of wood and then again that's the, the other reason why I'd, I love doing burls is because they come out with so much character and this one is right full of eyes. Be sure to check back next week for part two as our bowl takes shape. Stopped in at the Terrace in Gladstone for the annual Delta County Wildlife Unlimited Banquet, which included a special raffle as part of a joint effort between the Delta, Dickinson, and Iron County chapters of Wildlife Unlimited. Well, tonight's our 36th annual banquet, uh, our 35th sellout of 500 people. Uh, we have a lot of prizes available, up to 80 guns and bows and arrows and crossbows, log splitters, pretty much you name it, we have one of them here that's been donated and helped sponsored by people from Delta County. Uh, without their help, uh, this event could not take place. All the money goes to wildlife projects here in Delta County. Uh, those projects involve habitat, forest service projects, DNR projects, anything that has to do with wildlife, uh, if it swims, flies, or walks, we fund it. Tonight we have a special uh, raffle going on. It's the Tri-County Raffle, which involves Delta, Dickinson, and Iron Counties where we're raffling off a full-size farm tractor, which is the most expensive prize any of these organizations have ever given away, along with a riding lawnmower and another nice rifles. Well, the tractor raffle started way back in June of 2016. The three organizations got together at the Wildlife Unlimited of Delta County, Dickinson County, and Iron County. Uh, we had a meeting at the Pine Grove Country Club in, in Iron Mountain and we talked about a lot of different things about each other's banquets and how things are gone. And, and one of the things that came out of that meeting that kind of intrigued me the most was 
having some sort of a, a joint venture, a joint fundraiser of, of some sort. Basically over a year ago the three units got together, the three wildlifes, and just to talk about different banquet things that we do to see if somebody could help somebody else. And from that we decided to have a joint raffle that somebody hasn't done anything like that in the past and we could go with something bigger like this tractor rather than the general 4x4 that people give away all the time. We had an agreement at the beginning that we would divide all of the proceeds from that raffle amongst the three groups to help benefit all the, the counties that uh, took part in the raffle. We split all of the expenses three ways and we're splitting all of the profits three ways no matter which organization sells the most tickets. We figured that was the, the most fair way to do it. So I went out and I started getting prices from different different manufacturers, different companies, and uh, we went with the, the LS3037 from UP Tractor and Rock. They gave us a great deal on it. Local service, if, if anything, uh, does come about. Uh, he did a real good deal on us, and matter of fact, when we had to have a tractor in two different locations, he gave us another loaner tractor so that we could actually show at two different events at the same time. And uh, I thought that was real nice of him. The interesting part is we have sold tickets to uh, basically the entire United States, so anybody could win that tractor tonight. We did real well in Iron County this year. Uh, the fair brought us a lot of help. Uh, the rodeo brought us a lot of help. We had a bunch of vendors and, and uh, businessmen around town that were selling tickets for us. And We sold tickets all over the country. Uh, I believe there was some from Washington State. I've seen some from Florida, Massachusetts, Illinois, Ohio, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri. I mean, there's, there's interest in this, this thing from all over the place. So I think it's gonna turn out well. It was just good to get the three of us working together. And we had a lot of good feedback from people saying, hey, you know, this is nice to see more than one group get together and try and work on something. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out 906outdoors.com where you'll find the 906 fishing report, TV6 weather, shopping, and more. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering 906.